Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Grumman Pilot's YouTube channel. And today we're going to talk about regulations. Basically, what are in the FARs that every pilot should know before operating an aircraft. So stay tuned and let's have some fun. So we would like to ask you please subscribe, hit the like button, and hit the notify to stay current with our content. Well, as we talked about in our introduction, we're going to be talking today about regulations that every pilot should know. Now, this is going to cover a broad survey at a very high level, a lot of regulations. As a matter of fact, if we sat down and ragged every pertinent regulation for flying in just part 91, it would take about seven hours. And that's for somebody who's pretty good at speed reading. But anyway, let's go on and talk about the regulations you need to know. Now, of course, we have to ask you, why are you here? So are you here because this is going to substitute for ground school? And there's going to be a lot of good information in here, but you really still need to do your ground school component. Are you here for literacy? Do you just want to make sure you understand and know the objects that you need to know to fly an aircraft? Or were you looking up Grumman pilots and information on Grumman's on Google and you wound up here? Whatever the reason, let's go on and have some fun. Now my mission here is to make pilots safer and that is by making you aware of what's out there. This is not to start an argument. This is not to settle an argument. It's simply to give you the information you need to make you a safer pilot. Now, as some of you know, back in the day, back in 2006 and 2007, I worked for the Air Safety Foundation of um, AOPA, and I traveled around the country giving talks like this. And it's a great company to work for because they give you the presentations, all the material, the backup regs, tons of information. So if you see stuff written on the screen in one of these presentations, there's probably 10 to 20 times that much number of words written in the notes and all that we can draw from. So there's quite Quite a bit of information and I'd like to thank all the people at AOPA that stepped forward to help with this. So I know you're sitting there all complacent but here's some sample questions and let's see how you do on them. So when you're studying material like this what do you do? Do you learn them all? Do you just learn the ones you need to know? Or do you just want to pass your flight review? There's a lot to be learned here. The regulations change all the time and there's a lot of pilots who think that they haven't really changed since World War II. Let's put that to a, let's put that illusion to the test. And there's a lot at stake here. You can get killed. You can get injured. You can get in trouble with the law. You can get in trouble with your insurance company. There's a lot at stake by not knowing the regs and operating the aircraft improperly. Now, rarely do you get fined or you go to jail for something you do in an airplane. But things have been changing over the years. I mean, just look at what's happened to our licenses since World War II and people started, I'm sorry, World War I and people started flying. You know, and these rules change because of technology, because of safety, or because of awareness of safety. And then it's what we like to call the wheel of fartoon. It's a comedy of errors as people make rules and regulations of how the government think you need to fly. And then the rules are backed up by the court. And they come around to the fars and we begin the cycle again. Where do you fit into that process? And when something happens like an incident or an accident, that's when rules come into place. Public opinion demands that something happen, whether it be good or not. Some of the pr proposals, especially after, in the post 9-11 flying uh, world, there was, there was a move in Washington by the Transportation Security Administration to impose airline style security on all aviation and that would include general aviation and just to give you an idea of how absurd that would be there were proposals to require literally screening by TSA screeners at every single airport in the country you'd have to go through the metal detector take off your shoes put everything through um, the x-ray machine and obviously that, that that's a that's not a workable plan for general aviation with 15,000 some airports out there uh, private and public and so we were very very quick to respond to that and offer an alternative which is the AOPA airport watch program and the TSA actually partnered with with AOPA on that and it's been a very successful program and it's, it's prevented those types of uh, regulations from being implemented. Now there's a lot of information out there available to us but we need to consider is the information that we have out there is it binding meaning it's mandatory and we have to obey it or is it not binding? And we can see here that as we bring things out, advisory circulars, charts, those are binding. The airman's information manual, not so binding. 
your pilot command glossary. Again, not so binding. Airworthiness directives, yes. Pilot operator handbook, again, yes. Service bulletins, not so much in the U.S., but if you're in Canada, they are regulatory and binding. Now, when we talk about binding information, we're talking about things like your pilot operating handbook, your maintenance manual, your service manual for your aircraft line. Those are all things that you must follow. It is not an option. It's not required that you think about you want to do it. It is required that you must or shall do it. Our maintenance shop, Howard Aircraft, we have two employees that work on the repair station, unlike some of the bigger shops that have 50 employees. This proposed rulemaking could put a lot of shops out of business, especially on a small scale because they can't absorb the cost of it. If they do, they're going to have to pass it on to the end user, which would be the pilot. If we have to go out of business, the pilot's done. He has to find maintenance somewhere else. There's a lot out there on the horizon that could hurt GA. I mean, user fees. Do we want to have airline-style payment plans uh, for general aviation? Do we want to have TSAs at every small GA airport to get searched and take our shoes off before we go fly an airplane? I think for most of us, the answer to that is no, and we have to communicate that to our elected officials. If you're ever curious, just take a look in the Federal Register to get an idea of some of the things that are coming down the pike for GA. Some are good, like we like, like weight changes in weather and service stations, but then user fees and other things we might not want so much. And there's a lot on the table here and your participation is useful and can be sometimes be required. So the more they know about how we know, then maybe the rules will be changed in our favor. And that's why we have advocates like the people at AOPA and other organizations that carry our voice to those that make the rules that we fly by. There are official and unofficial ways to hear about a FAA proposal or regulatory change. The official method is through what's called the Federal Register, which is a government publication that's issued daily uh, out of Washington, and that's certainly what AOPA looks at every day. AOPA disseminates the information to members through uh, the, our magazine, AOPA Pilot, through uh, the online uh, weekly newsletter, ePilot, and through our website and uh, seminars and live uh, FERCs and other, other uh, seminars that Phil Boyer does. AOPA on specific issues will partner with other groups. For example, there are type clubs all over the country for different types of aircraft. So if an AD comes out in an airworthiness directive, for example, on a Bonanza, there's a Bonanza um, club that, uh, type club that we'll work with to not only get information from them on the technical aspects of the AD, but to develop a response and solicit a comment to the FAA to try and forestall any uh, action that isn't appropriate. And the problem with FARS is they change. It's too fast for some, too slow for others. They're about as dull as dishwater. Legalese gets involved. And did you really learn them all in ground school and you still have them available to you today? It's kind of like theater. Badly done theater, but nonetheless. So let's go and throw in a disclaimer here. Um, this is not legal advice, wasn't intended to be. Let's throw in a few more disclaimers. And you can see on the packaging that we see every day that sometimes disclaimers get to be quite humorous in their interpretation. And sometimes the rules are written overly complicated. I mean, we all know to use seat and shoulder belts, but look at the regs. Quite a bit of wording, isn't it? And there is other information out there, a book written by Kent Jackson, who will help you interpret what the laws really say for regulations. It just depends on your level of interest of how much you want to understand what's going on. And there's a lot of information out there in book form. And if you put them all in your airplane, it's going to weigh what two to five gallons of fuel weighs. So there's quite a bit of printed information that you can carry along with you, should you so desire. And keep in mind, all this material is from 2007, but electronically available today in in-flight weather, we have a wealth of information available to us when we operate our aircraft. And electronically, we can get our information for a number of different ways, paying attention to the effective date and where it's coming from. And most of the websites, the FAA and the AOPA website, as well as the Grumman Pilot Association website, it's all searchable in a number of different ways for the information that you need so that you can operate your airplane the best you can and in the safest manner possible. 
So they are making more laws, and they're made out of paper. And as someone likes to say, books are made out of paper, and they will not cushion you if you should have metal meet rock, meaning your airplane hits the ground pretty hard. Books aren't going to help you there. And then let's talk about the rulemaking process. But I do like this little joke at the end that uh, rulemaking is like having sausages made. You don't like seeing it done. How AOPA evaluates proposals and pr proposed rules that come out of the government, um, the first thing we do is we look to the membership uh, to determine what kind of impact this is going, going to have on you, the average pilot. Of course, most of us here at AOPA are pilots, and um, so we think we have some understanding of what it's going to do, but it's important to get out to the general pilot population and determine what the impact is and then set out a course of action based on that on how we're either going to uh, support a, a change to a regulation or oppose it or uh, alter the outcome so that it's favorable for general aviation. For the FAA to actually change a rule or for somebody to petition to change an, a federal aviation regulation, there's an official process called the regulatory process. and. What happens is the FAA issues what's called a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, an NPRM. It's published in the Federal Register as an official publication. There's a comment period. Often there are public meetings. Uh, things like an airspace change, for example, would be issued through a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. I say a change to Class B airspace in Atlanta, for example. And after the public comment period, it goes through a long bureaucratic process and comes out the other end usually in about 14 to 16 months as a final rule with an implementation date. As you can see, it's a rapidly changing landscape. That means we fly through something that's changing quite a bit. New things are being added, new rules and reg. But it's incumbent upon you, the pilot in command, to stay current with all of that, again, for safety. And there's always the null report that comes out every year, and it records what was the problem. VFR into IMC, one problem. The next biggest problem is fuel management. To the tune of like two and a half people run out of fuel every week while flying their aircraft. And we could make an example. We could say we were following Fred. So let's watch Fred get ready for flying. First thing he's going to do, he's going to plan the flight. Okay, then he's going to, is it planning for the pilot? Does he need to have everything checked? An example of, the, of a recent proposal that AOPA has uh, advocated for it has to do with the pilot medical, which anybody who's an active pilot obviously needs an FAA medical. And we petitioned the FAA to extend the duration of the third class medical to five years, and the FAA just recently issued an NPRM that proposes just that, uh, an extension from three years to five years for medicals for pilots that are age 40 and under. Now what you can do is make sure that you are logging the amount of time that you are acting as pilot in command. And this all goes towards your time and type. And it doesn't like some of the movies where they like to have a guy go, do you have any time in this type? And he looks at his watch and says it's like 930. So you want to make sure that you're up to speed on you and you're up to speed on your knowledge of your aircraft. And currency plays an issue in how well you operate an airplane. So make sure that you're current. And then there's planning for the airplane. What are you going to do for insurance? Are you going to get your fuel from an FBO? Is your maintenance being done? Is it part 23? Is it part 43? Or how much of it is owner-supplied maintenance? Are you as a student pilot changing the oil, cleaning the spark plugs? These all play into your planning a flight in your aircraft. And then you're going to plan your route, and as part of that, you're going to decide where you're going to stop. The beauty of all that is today, the wealth of information we have on our smartphones, on our airplane consoles, we have a tremendous amount of information to allow us to pick a nice, safe route when we have to operate today. Are we doing anything special in this flight? Are we flying someplace where we shouldn't be underneath? So there's a lot that goes into this, and I do like that closing argument that Pilot, if you are what you eat, then pilots need to eat more chicken. Even if you're part 91, you need to brief your passengers on what they can expect and to handle accordingly. Also, as part of the planning, take into account weather. Look at your alternates, look at your advisories, and look at the minimums anywhere you plan on going in your aircraft. This, again, will enhance the safety of your flight operations. And now we've arrived at the pre-flight. So make sure that your pre-flight is good and you've not missed anything and use a checklist. And then after we've done our pre-flight, we begin taxiing into the runway. And that is where we need to really keep our eyes on a swivel and look outside the cockpit to make sure that we're not violating somebody else's roadway. 
and then once we get to the runway we take off and we depart we have to decide are we coming back to the field or are we going in route and if we're going in route then we want to make sure that our weather is okay that we have enough fuel on board because after all one of the top two reasons that airplanes come out of the sky is fuel starvation and then as we're flying and take into account weather, we have a lot of information available on the radio to us. Uh, you know, and just remember they like to say that if you crash, you're going to get buried on a sunny day. And then when you make your approach to the airport, look out for other traffic, be advising on the appropriate frequencies, and getting ready for your final landing. And then you're finally coming in for landing. Make sure you have clearance if you're at a towered airport. And if things don't look right, uh, go around err on the side of safety when you're flying and then when you get it on the ground you can begin looking at the post flight of what is wrong with the airplane what i might want to make a note for my mechanic as well as i do all of that while i'm tying the airplane and getting it secured after the flight and as in all things be sure to log your time whatever kind of time it was because if you don't log it it really never happened and there are a lot of things out there that can trump afar um, the biggest one is common sense operate like in an emergency where you can deviate from all rules to handle that emergency use your common sense and get the airplane safely on the ground well ignorance of the law is no defense and 91.3 there's a lot of information there and now you read it right but you don't always need law for some things like gravity is not a law but it equally applies to us emergencies we can come and handle but we always want to look at what regs that we might be operating under and then when we get to the, meet the FAA we at least can have an intelligent conversation with them and explain our side of it or their side of it however it works out and if there is an issue was it an accident or was it an incident they are different and the FAA does handle them accordingly differently so make sure you're doing the right thing and as always you can always report this via the ASRS forms from NASA basically your get out of jail free form and if there is a problem then you have to decide who's responsible and enforcement can come about by several ways legislation uh, you can have to retest you can get your license pulled you can be fined money or you can go to jail now the last two are not very often happening so don't worry so much about going to jail and paying money most folks think of AOPA as a magazine but we're so much more than that uh, there are about a dozen dedicated staff that work in Washington DC and we're fighting for your rights every day well I know that was a lot to digest it was a lot of information there and that is only a skim coating we did not go very deep we hope you found it all useful and informative thanks for watching and have a great day flying your Grumman Freckles our cat supervisor and we'd like to introduce the new cats to you we have hopscotch there on the left the other small ginger is Tarzan he came with that name and his sister will be popping up in just a second and her name is Sweet Pea these are the new cats that we've adopted into our home it's going to be a nice little family and we're having a ball thanks for watching